Welcome to another video. Let's talk about the precise definition of a limit. I have um, about two or three videos on this topic, but I had to take this one down because when I first made the video, I made a couple of errors and I got many comments about those errors, but I decided to leave the video up because it was helping other people understand it, those who didn't realize the errors. But at some point I took it down and I promised myself I was going to redo it. So this is the redo of the video you've seen before if you've ever watched my video on Epsilon Delta Proof. Now, this is a very easy proof, but somehow the way it is written in the textbook or it is explained often confuses students and it is one of the most difficult topics that I've seen students talk about. They just don't understand it. But I am sure after watching this video, you will understand it. Let's get into it. This is the precise definition of the limit. It's what you see on the board. If it looks confusing, don't worry about it. You will understand it. But one thing you have to do is learn how to state it after you understand it. So this is easy. The easy part is the limit of any function as x approaches a is equal to l. The only reason we can claim that the limit is l is if for all epsilon there's a number called epsilon. Let's explain what epsilon is. So here you have a graph and here you have a function. Let's, say, let's take this function. Let's pick a point for a. Suppose a is here. This is where a is. So this function we're dealing with is called f of x. Okay? The function f of x is defined over an open interval. When you say an open interval, it means that we're not going to say, hey, you got to stop here. You can keep going to the right forever. That's an open interval. Okay? You can keep going to the right forever. So even if your interval is from 0 to 1, as you can see, there is no end to this. Every number just greater than zero. So 0 0.0000000000001 is still in here. All right? So as long as the number is greater than zero, as long as the number is less than one, and there are infinitely many numbers, so that's what you call an open interval. So this is an open interval such that you can keep going to the right forever, you can keep going to the left forever. That's the meaning of an open interval. So the precondition is this function is defined over an open interval. It doesn't mean it is defined at A itself because you could have a hole here. It's possible that the function is actually not defined at the point A, but it doesn't matter when it comes to limit. The question is the behavior from the left compared to the behavior from the right. Does it look like if you keep driving on this road, you're going to this city, and if you're coming from this way, your mind tells you you're going to this city. If in both, direction, it both directions, it looks like you're going to the same value, then you see this point is what you call the limit of the function at A. So this function is defined over this open interval, and you pick a point, point A, within the open interval. Now we're saying that the limit of this function at point A will be equal to L. This sentence is true if, this is the only reason you can claim this is true, if for all epsilon greater than zero. Now remember, epsilon and delta are two numbers. They're just numbers. We just won't like using special characters. That's why we said epsilon. What is this epsilon? It is a distance that you measure. You can see that this distance, epsilon is attached to the function, the y-axis, and delta is attached to x and a. 
That's the horizontal axis. What we're saying is, whenever you take this epsilon, this small distance, and you move away from the limit just a little, either you go up or you go down, okay? You either increase the height or you drop it. That's what it means. For every epsilon greater than zero, greater than zero means it's a positive number. Remember, distance has to be positive. Okay, it's like the length of a, of a table cannot be minus. That's the reason we said greater than zero. That's the only reason. The same thing for this because we're measuring distances. Okay, so if you go up a little or you go down a little, that's what this means. So let's, let's just follow the definition. For every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero. What it means is, this claim of the limit is only true if when you move away from the limit by an epsilon amount, so that this is now L plus epsilon, or you go down, which is L minus epsilon, because this distance is epsilon, okay, the distance from the limit. Look, let's trace this up here. What do you notice? Whenever you have there exists an epsilon, uh, for every epsilon there exists a delta such that, just, I just want you to watch what I'm doing. Whenever you move away from A, okay? So X minus A, the absolute value of X minus A is basically the distance you move away from A. That's how you measure absolute value, okay? The distance you move away from A. Don't confuse that. Look at this. Five minus 3 is basically the distance you move away from 3 or the distance you move away from 5. It doesn't matter because your answer in either case will be 2. So whether it's 5 minus 3 or you just want to subtract the one that is fixed. So since A is a fixed point and X is changing, it's moving, that's why we said it's X minus A. Now the distance you move away from A it's definitely greater than zero. Remember, it's a distance. As long as it is less than delta, as long as that distance, you don't go too far away from A. You don't go too far away from A. So for every epsilon, there has to be some delta. Okay, there are two options here. Okay, this looks like a smaller option compared to this. So you don't want to go past this delta. You don't want to take this option. You want to take this because if you're within this distance, you can be within that same distance here, and you notice that you'll still be close. You'll be still you'll still be within the epsilon distance from the limit. That's the whole idea here. So what we're saying is, for every epsilon, there exists a particular delta such that if the distance you move away from A is less than delta, then the distance that the function is going to move away from the limit will still be within epsilon, which is true. Imagine, let's say this is the delta we have picked. So we call this A plus delta. So we're within this delta distance. Pick any point here. If you stay within this distance, less than delta distance, and you trace it up here, if you try to go here, you're within epsilon. You cannot escape epsilon as long as, oof, as long as you stay within delta. But let's assume you come here, you pick a point here. This point we just picked is not within delta because the delta distance is from here. Look, let me translate, let me transfer it right there. So this is A minus delta. So if you choose a point here and you trace it at this point, it looks as if it's within epsilon, right? The distance from, of the function is within, it's still within. It's only true on one side. It is not true on the other side. If I decide to replicate this and take it to the other side, that's what this absolute value means. It means whether it's on the left or right, it doesn't matter. If I go this way, look, that's the distance. If I trace it this way, it is not within epsilon. So the delta that we need is the smaller value, and that's the whole essence of limit. 
the only reason you can claim that L is the limit of this function is if, if the distance you move away from A is less than delta, then the distance you're going to move away from L will always be less than epsilon. That's the explanation of the whole thing. It's not complicated. It is our job now to prove that the limit of this function is equal to 11. Clearly, you can see it because this is what makes life really tough for students. You can say, come on, if I plug in 3 into this, it is 4 times 3 is 12. 12 minus 1 is 11. I know it's the limit, but you need to prove it using the precise definition. And this is what we're going to do here. So you have to make some analogy. Just go here and look at it. What is our A in this problem here? Our A is 3, right? So in your head or just on your piece of paper, just say by definition, by definition, the limit as x goes to 3 of 4x minus 1 is equal to 11 if for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that if, you see, I'm just using this definition to rewrite this using the parameters that are provided such that if zero is less than x minus three, is less than delta, then the implication is that the function, what is the function we have? This is our function. 4x minus 1 minus, what is the limit? 11 is less than epsilon. That's it. This is what you want to prove. You want to prove that if this then this. How do you prove it? Well, it's easy. So remember, the key expression is for every epsilon, there is a delta. So we need to find a delta. Okay, once you can find a delta, you're done, because that's what the definition says. If there's an epsilon, there exists a delta, there exists a delta. If for all epsilon, there exists a delta, okay? It doesn't matter how far you move away, as long as there's a delta that we can use, we're good. Okay, so what do we do? You wanna start actually from here, whenever you're looking for your delta. You wanna go here because we're saying for all epsilon, we don't care what epsilon is, it doesn't matter what epsilon is, we wanna find a delta. So we can start from here, okay? So if we start from here, we know that 4x minus 1, which is the function, minus L, which is the limit, is less than epsilon. Okay, this is where we want to start. Now, we try to simplify this. We have the absolute value of 4x. If you remove the parenthesis, this becomes minus 12, is less than epsilon. Now, you have to start thinking in your head. Remember that every time you're given a problem, what you're looking for is x minus 3. Can you get x minus 3 from this expression? Because once you get your x minus 3, you can relate it to the delta you're looking for. So here, we can say this is the same thing as 4 times x minus 3 less than epsilon. The absolute value of a scalar, a positive scalar and an expression, you can pull this out since the 4 is positive, so you have 4 times the absolute value of x minus 3 is less than epsilon. So that the absolute value of x minus 3 is less than epsilon over 4. You divide both sides by 4. But pay attention, what you just did here looks exactly like what we have here. So, with what you have here, you can easily guess that your delta is epsilon over 4. So, you can say, I guess 
Some say I guess, some say I choose. Delta is equal to epsilon over four. It does not matter what epsilon is. Remember what we said. For every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta. The symbol is there exists, okay? So it doesn't matter what epsilon is. Whatever epsilon you get divided by four, that's gonna be your delta. Whatever epsilon is divided by four, that's gonna be your delta and it's gonna work. If it doesn't work, then it means this limit is not correct. So now that you have guessed or you've chosen delta to be epsilon over four, you need to go use it to prove that this delta equals epsilon over four is gonna work. So here, so this is the first part. The second part is to show that delta equals epsilon over four works. Okay, this is what we need to show. We want to show that this delta equals epsilon over four works. And let's go back again to what we said. We said that for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta such that if this is true, then this has to be true. So we have claimed that our delta is epsilon over four. We need to go show that this is true. Remember, we started from this side to get our epsilon, our delta. Now we're gonna go, we need to go use that delta to show that this part is gonna be true since we have assumed that delta is epsilon over four. So what do you do? The same way you started is how you're gonna start here, but this time leave out this part. We don't care about this part, okay? We're gonna say that the absolute value of four X minus one minus 11. Based on what we said, remember we said this is gonna be less than epsilon. That's what we claimed, that this is gonna be less than epsilon if our delta, if x minus three is less than delta, that this is gonna be less than epsilon. That's our mission now, okay? So we're gonna act as if we know what delta is, and we said that if this is true about our delta, then the other part is gonna be true for our epsilon. Okay, so here we go. Now, to test this, what do we do? You just do algebra, okay? So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna say that this is equal to, uh, or I can write it on this side. How do we simplify this? We can write it as 4x minus 12, right? Absolute value. What else can we do? We can say this is the same thing as four multiplied by the absolute value of x minus three. Right? That's the calculation we did here. Okay, so where does this save me? Well, remember, this is four times, what is x minus three again? Remember the claim we're making that x minus three is less than delta. If x minus three is less than delta, it means this next line I am writing has to be less than, because I'm gonna change this now, because this is less than delta, four times, four times this will be less than four times delta. 2 is less than 3, right? So 4 times 2 has to be less than 4 times 3. That's the idea here. So whatever you have here, because this is less than delta, this is less than 4 times delta. But what did we say delta was? Epsilon over 4. And what is that? So we have proved or proven that this is less than epsilon. I hope this was helpful. 
leave a comment in the comment section. I'll make another video or maybe two or more videos on this topic. Never stop learning. Those who stop learning, stop living. Bye-bye.